So again, welcome to the Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online. My name is Michael Andrick. I am the archivist at the Ukrainian History and Education Center in Somerset, New Jersey. We are located in the middle of the state, kind of in between uh, New York City and Philadelphia. And we also do lots of online programming as well as in-person content. Uh, just to do a little bit of uh, uh, acknowledgement, uh, we are funded by some grant funding from the New Jersey Council on the Humanities National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as money from the Somerset County Cultural and Heritage Commission and the New York New Jersey State Council on the Arts. Uh, we are grateful for them. And if you are in the United States, please lobby your elected representatives to make sure that this kind of funding continues. It's very important for small organizations like ours. Uh, we have a website. We have speakers, as we indicate here, we have speakers, workshops, and resources are available. We've been giving lots of talks, lots of folk arts workshops, uh, spreading the word about, about Ukraine, about its history, about its culture. Um, we are available to do that in person, online, and to the greatest extent that we are able to. Uh, we have an in-person exhibition currently up on artwork related to the Holodomor. Uh, you can read about that online on our exhibits, under the exhibits tab. What's very interesting is this actually got picked up by the Holodomor Museum in Ukraine. They have actually publicized our exhibition, which is fantastic. Uh, we also have the online version of our previous exhibition, which is on Ukrainian religious history and its connection to um, to um, historical events and and geopolitics and other forces over the course of several centuries. Uh, that is that ex exhibition is no longer up in person, but it is 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 available online. It, there's a link under the sidebar when you go to the exhibits page on our website. I would like to offer all of you who donated, uh, gave a voluntary donation in the registration for this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, we know, we understand that your ability to donate may be limited. Those of you, you some of you may have already donated considerably to humanitarian relief aid and other efforts in Ukraine. That is fantastic. We commend you. Um, if you are able to, uh, please consider donating to organizations here uh, in the states as well, such as us or to Sutro, um, who are in some ways, in, in our own small ways or big ways, perhaps, uh, fighting the, the war on the, on the cultural front. So without, so I will now introduce our speakers. So we have two volunteers from Sutro. Uh, Erica Peasley and Jiley, Kylie Jolliker. Uh, Erica is uh, Administrative Operations Coordinator at Centurion Solutions LLC, a disaster and emergency management consultancy. Uh, she provides expertise regarding cultural heritage, and he's she's interested in sort of the 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 intersection, I guess, between cultural property and emergency planning. Uh, she serves as a situation monitoring coordinator for Sutro, which I'm sure she'll tell you more about what exactly that means. Um, Kylie is a metadata strategies librarian at the at Syracuse University Libraries. She is involved in Sutro's gallery working group designing metadata to describe web archive cultural heritage objects and other content. And so that that warms warms my heart. Um, uh, as an archivist, and I, hopefully she will she will convey how important things like metadata are in um, in in the work that we do. It's not just enough to pull stuff down from online or digitize lots of photos or lots of images, and then have no idea what it is that you're looking at. So I will go ahead and hand it over to them. Thank you very much for joining for 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 being here to join.
Okay, can everyone see that all right? It took a second to load for me. Thank you. Yes, that's fine. Thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Forrester. Okay, should I try to share my screen, Randy? Please go okay. ahead. Okay, here we go. Kylie? Okay. okay. All right. Yeah, I was just getting some audio interference. Oh, there. Okay. No problem. So just to introduce before Erica takes it away, um, just kind of as a brief overview as we start before we move into some of the more specific things. Um, what what is Sujo? So it's over 1300 cultural heritage professionals from a very wide range of fields, um, librarians, archivists, researchers, digital humanists, programmers, um, all working to identify and archive at-risk sites, digital content, data uh, in Ukrainian cultural heritage institutions while the country is, of course, under attack. Uh, so we use a combination of technologies that we'll kind of touch on a little bit more as we proceed um, to crawl and archive sites and content. Um, some of these are existing technologies like Internet Archives Wayback Machine and Browser Tricks Crawler um, and some other kind of custom things that we use as well. And as of October 2022, just to kind of start off at a, at a kind of statistic here, um, we've saved more than 51 terabytes of scanned documents, artworks, other sorts of, of digital materials, which is an enormous, enormous amount of data. Um, and we've, we've done this from more than 5,400 websites, and I believe that number is actually even higher now um, from museums, libraries, archives, and other types of institutions. So as Kylie mentioned, the Sucho effort is comprised of more than 1,300 people. Um, I think at the height of it, we may have had 14, 1,500 people in our Slack channel. Um, and we come from literally all over the world. You can see on the map here, um, Kylie has gone through and did some amazing map work. Um, the areas in yellow are all countries in which we have volunteers. And of course, there's a little bit of a glitch. Um, and as we'll get into, we always need a human there to make sure the computer's doing the thing uh, correctly. Um, but there's, we have volunteers as far away as New Zealand and in a few other countries that I don't think got pinged on our API search or whatever magic Kylie ended, do, ended up doing. Um, so as she said, it's, we are from all different fields. Um, my background is in museums, but I now work in emergency management, but we have programmers, we have stay-at-home moms that just really wanted to help. Um, and if you hear my dogs running in the background, I'm sorry. Um, it, we've just all come together to help out and try to um, make sure there's a backup for Ukrainian heritage. The whole process we've, I think one of our um, key volunteers likened it to a digital Dunkirk. As you can see in these photos, um, we've pulled any and every kind of machine that you can use for programming languages or for any kind of digital archiving, we've put it to use. Um, actually, my computers are up at the top where the Harvard thing is. Um, we, I pulled out an old G3 I had in the closet and we're still trying to fix it and make it into a crawler. Um, people have used Raspberry Pis. They went out and bought Raspberry Pis. I mean, it's it's a really incredible effort when we sit down and think of all the different tools we've had running at our own homes. And these are outside of our daily jobs. Um, so it's been an incredible effort. Um, they're in the early parts of the war many, many late nights where we are just making sure everything got archived before something went down. Um, so yeah, it's uh, Dunkirk for a new age. Part of the process that we have is situation monitoring, and that's the team I lead. Um, early on in the war, 
um, we'll get into it later. And I think Kylie might have added a screenshot, but we had a master spreadsheet that was dubbed by one of our Dutch volunteers, the spreadsheet, which just means giant spreadsheet. Um, but that is its its actual official name now. And um we had millions of cells and I can't tell you how many different rows and just a massive information. So we didn't really know where to start. And because it's an active war zone, it's a little bit more chaotic because a lot of us weren't even there to know what was going on. Um, thanks to my emergency management job, um, I started kind of trying to tinker with um, open source information, monitoring Twitter. Um, there are a lot of apps that have the air raid alerts for Ukraine. As you can see in the right side of the screen, we started using those um, feeds and those alerts to try to prioritize where we needed to focus on the archiving efforts. Um, as you see now on the news that there's a lot of power outages, that was a huge concern in the early days of the war when we were still trying to pull information from something that was powered ultimately in a machine, in a building, in Ukraine, usually. Um, so as of late October, um, now well over 30% of the infrastructure, energy, infra, energy infrastructure in Ukraine has been damaged or completely destroyed. Um, they have been incredible in trying to re, um, repower places, but there have been a lot of energy cuts in places that weren't even concerned about um, shelling or anything six, seven months ago, like Lviv, um, Cherkasky, things in the Western um, part of the country. So. It's a very dynamic part of the um, effort. It's a very, it's not the traditional thing you would associate with archiving or any kind of archiving, digital, analog, whatnot. So, <clears throat> I guess this is still me. Um, so part of what we did um, to make sure we were capturing the most amount of digital cultural heritage was initially we had started, um, we had scraped or we used the metadata from Wikidata, which is not Wikipedia, but it's one of those open source collective environments with a lot of information. And they do have a lot of information and locations for important sites. And Kylie can speak to this a lot more than I can. She is an amazing expert in that. Um, but that was our basis and people started contributing more. And as things got a little bit more worrisome and uh, we were noticing there were a lot of regional, very small mom and pop um, babushas deciding to make a museum in the back part of their garden, we were missing that in Wikidata because it wasn't notable enough for someone from wherever to put it on that website. So we started doing what we called sweeps. We would literally go on Google Maps in our town that was in an air raid area and just try to find anything that was a library, a museum, a school, and to see if they had an online presence. Um, we have a fantastic researcher who's a librarian named Carrie Pierman, and I can't tell you how many different sites she found. It was incredible and also very sad to think about how much we were missing, just not had it had we not gone on Google Maps. So this is this Kylie. Like. All right. So to get a little bit more specific with some of these things, I'm going to give an overview of some of our different moving parts because there are many different connected pieces that are happening within Sucho. So many different projects that are sort of independent but are still all interconnected. So one of the big ones that Erica has already kind of introduced is the actual web scraping itself. Um, so we're using technologies like browser tricks and web recorder, which are programs that allow us to go and do this work. Um, we archive the files that are scraped. So basically when we scrape a website, we are creating a archival version of it. And there's a few different ways to do that that have a lot of kind of technical complications um, of how to choose what you're going to do and how it's then going to be playable in the future. 
But once we've produced that um, with kind of the best fit technology, we archive it, of course. Um, and so we were using Amazon Web Services, and now we're using um, what's called Wasabi, uh, which allows us to have a lot more hot storage so that we can actually um, have a greater amount of, of files in there. Um, and just to reiterate something that I already mentioned, but as of October, so last month, um, we have over 51 terabytes of skin materials. And I tried to come up with a good way to kind of explain how much that is. And I failed <laughs> because that's just an enormous, enormous amount of data. I mean, terabytes are much, much, much larger than gigabytes. So we're talking a, a colossal amount of information that's very difficult to then store. So that's one of our, our kind of ongoing focuses is how to make sure that we're taking care of it. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, over 5,400 websites um, we have scraped, um, galleries, museums, LARC, uh, libraries, archives, local heritage organizations, all the way, like Erica said, from very, very small local organizations, some of which might not have a physical presence, but has a web presence, all the way up to the National University. So this, unfortunately, is actually from today. I went through this afternoon um, coordinating with Erica on Slack, which is how we do much of our work. Um, most of the volunteers have never met in person. We're all over the world, as you saw. Um, so she and I were coordinating over Slack earlier. Um, this is unfortunately something that one of the volunteers posted um, after the strikes today. So more than 40% of the sites um, with a .ua domain are down. Um, I believe they're coming back up. You can kind of see that a little bit here. There's a little bit of a rebound, uh, but that's lower than we've seen it since we started doing this. Um, this graph only, of course, goes back to the beginning of October, but we have not seen an outage this massive um, since we started at least tracking the data. This is a, another visualization of the same thing. This is produced by uh, netblocks.org. Um, Lviv Oblast is below 25% connectivity. So that really shows how massive the damage was and how widespread the power outages are. Because obviously if you don't have power, your servers are not operating, so your web presence is down. That's also further complicated by the fact that physical damage also will of course, destroy a server wherein you cannot recoup the data. Um, so sometimes power outages, the sites will come back up, but damage or any kind of system failure will prevent that from happening and could potentially cause a massive data loss, which is one of the reasons that we do this because we don't know if it's going to come back. You can see up here, it's really tiny, sorry. <laughs> um, this little outage map up here, you can, you can see in the Western regions, um, some of the kind of, uh, larger spots of, of damage from today, um, and it correlates to this map here too. One of the things that we're working on right now um, is building a um, database of this material that we've archived, and this will help people um, actually view this material, because of course, um, and I'll talk about this more later, but we're doing this to give this material back. We're not doing this to keep this stuff. This is not our materials. We are archiving this so that it isn't lost, and then we can give it back to the institutions if they need it. Um, but we also want people, including these institutions, to be able to access it. Um, so we're building a database that will allow searching of this material. And like Mike had mentioned, um, this is done by making sure that we have metadata about the materials, which is stored um, in this database. So metadata is, in its simplest form, data about data. So it, the metadata that we have on these is data that describes what these web archive files are, where they're from, what URL they were scraped from, et cetera, who's the, who's the owning institution. Um, so we're currently designing the data and building the tables. So we're actually doing the, the, the modeling and the construction for this. And we're going to be automating the data for import using um, Wikidata and our existing Google Sheets because we have many Google Sheets and many very large Google Sheets. Um, and Wikidata, like Erica mentioned, is a really fantastic resource for this because it is uh, the linked data service that's associated with Wikidata or with Wikipedia, it is Wikidata. Um, so basically what it is, is it's sort of a, a crowdsourced linked data um, platform. 
And so we can use the data that's there, but we can also add to the data that's there. So we're uh, currently developing workflows for when there are institutions that we know of that are not represented in that data, we can add them. And then both we can benefit from that information, the institutions can benefit from that information, and other users of the platform can benefit from that information because it is open public source data. Um, and of course, the consideration with that is making sure that we are considering safety every step of the way. Um, so that's very much one of our, our focuses as we go through our data construction, and decide what to make public and what not to. The benefit of, of doing this database is uh, having the, that public facing user interface. Um, and one of the things that we're working on um, is visualizations with a program called data set. So this is an example here that you can see um, where it visualizes some of the, um, the, the scrape files that we have from different institutions and it visualizes it on a map where you can see it. Um, and this is in the full form, uh, very interactive. And so you could click on any of these, you can zoom in, zoom out, et cetera, um, and be able to find materials that you're interested in viewing and then be able to actually open them up. We also have another metadata component. Um, we love metadata, it's a lot of metadata happening. Um, and there are a lot of links for different pieces of this. I'll be able to drop those in the chat um, at the end. I have, I have the full list. They're a little bit easier to access than on the slides. Um, we have been working with the Internet Archive, um, which is another uh, kind of nonprofit endeavor. Uh, Internet Archive is very large. It's been around for many years. Um, and what we have been able to do is take items that have been scraped from these websites um, and put them in the Internet Archive, which is another way of making them um, uh, digitally preserved, but also available for people to look at. So to date, we have done over 6,331 items, um, over 2,500 of which are images. Um, some are also text, there's music, there's videos, there's a, a huge, huge uh, range of things. They represent over 48 institutions, more than 13 cities, um, text in more than 10 different languages. And this is just what has been worked so far. So these items, um, are identified and then the metadata is adapted from what the host institutions have shared. So we're using their information to help protect their, their materials. Um, and that is, you know, a, they've gotten through a very sizable chunk of this, but there's still very much more to come, which is very exciting. Um, and this material that we've worked through that has been put onto the internet archive um, is, available and even the stuff that hasn't quite been been finished yet is also available for now it's just a little bit harder to find because without that metadata describing it it's more difficult to locate things um, and know what they are which is why we go through and, and we add the metadata to them another point of metadata which is my favorite thing um, is the uh, omeka gallery and so um, it was very difficult to kind of show what this looks like so i hope that many of you will take the opportunity to go and actually look at the site um, because it's much better than this screenshot that I have here, which does not actually do it justice. Um, but I tried to take an image of it to show you and it was itty bitty and you <laughs> could not really see um, anything that, that really represented it. But the gallery um, is a way for us to raise funding, raise awareness, provide learning materials. Um, and we use the web scraped materials and uh, also we will be using digitized materials, which is something that we're, we're starting um, to work with uh, Ukrainian institutions to act as a platform for their digitized materials, especially while the National um, Digital Library of Ukraine is underway. It's, it's not something that uh, fully exists yet. It's not fully realized, um, but we hope that we can act as kind of a an in-between measure at the very least to support some of these materials um, in lieu of having that ready at the moment. So we started this project in May, which was not very long after Sutu actually started. Um, and then we published it in July and we're adding new things all the time. This is work that's happening constantly. Um, our emphasis is really on Ukrainian language. So this is kind of what I chose to show badly <laughs> on the side here, um, which is the fact that the Ukrainian description, um, whether it's it's the city name, the host institution name, etc., cetera, um, always appears first. But there's also an English translation available. And the materials are um, findable on the platform by both of these. So you can search both 
the Ukrainian language and the English language uh, data. And um, all of this material, you can click right on it um, and it will bring you to other things in the gallery that are that have that same data. So um, if this is, is uh, from Mariupol, you can click on that and you can view other items that are from institutions there. We also have the meme wall, which a little birdie told us you all might be very interested in hearing about. So we'll kind of circle back around to this later. Um, we have passed 1000 memes, which is extremely exciting. When I was in there yesterday, I think it was like 1200 now. Um, we're, we're, we've passed it quite quickly. Um, and what we do here is we curate memes from social media, um, Telegram, Twitter, Reddit, etc. And the meme wall itself was specifically developed for this project. Um, it's a, a platform that, that shows the memes and also shows the metadata of the memes so that you can search them, uh, you can facet by what you would like to see, so what, what kinds of memes, and we'll talk a little bit about templating later. Um, and one of the things that we're doing in conjunction with this is creating pedagogical material. So the memes are a little bit different in the fact that these aren't necessarily things that we can give back because they're not from institutions. Um, they're kind of being created as a kind of culturally relevant moment. Um, and what we can do is create pedagogical materials where these can be used for teaching, they can be used for study, et cetera. Um, and this is a little bit outdated here on the right, but uh, this is a visit summary from a couple weeks ago. Um, and we had more than 6,000 views in this period of time, which was very exciting because the Mumal has been around for a little bit, um, but it's just starting to get much larger. Um, so it was very exciting to see that many visits in that period of time. We also have uh, the equipment fund. So fundraising is one of our, our kind of major things that we focus on. Um, and we've raised 181,000 euros to date, um, 5,000 of which was donated to uh, Shevchenko University Library. Um, this information is all publicly available on this website, which again, I'll share the link. Um, so our financials are transparent. And we, um, accept donations to this fund and use it for um, equipment purchases as well as, as donations like this one, um, laptops, scanners, power banks, cameras, et cetera. So institutions can let us know what we need and we can purchase it through suppliers and have it sent to them. Um, and it's a very complicated process that I'm not necessarily qualified to describe the whole way through um, because it's something that I kind of deal with tangentially just as, as being a volunteer, but I don't actually work on the team that handles this. Um, but the, uh, the hope is that we'll be able to make a really big impact in improving and expanding institutions um, digitization capabilities by providing them with the equipment that they need, um, whether it's new equipment or things like the power banks that they need to run their own equipment um, when they don't have power. Um, as kind of a, a transition into um, what Eric is going to talk about next too is, is the fact that like I mentioned, this is this is post custodial archiving. So our goal is not to kind of collect things for study, but rather our goal is repatriation of materials. This is not our stuff. This is their stuff. So we're going to give it back. Um, and uh, as Eric very aptly said when we were kind of designing this <laughs> this um, presentation, was that Ukrainian heritage requires Ukrainian custodians. And that is such a succinct way of underscoring what this entire initiative is about. We're just using our expertise in whatever field it is um, to support our Ukrainian peers. We have the time and we have the safety and we have the materials to be able to do this work. So we're doing it to assist them, not to step in and do this instead. So we're working with Ukrainian institutions to steer our work to meet their needs. Um, it is obviously very hard sometimes to kind of start those conversations. So we do what we can um, in between those conversations as well. So there's a lot of self-direction happening, which is how the initiative started, but we're also listening to their needs um, and what we can better do to help them. Um, and we're also developing documentation and workflows that can be shared and reused. Yeah, and I wanted to add on to what Kylie just said about the equipment fund. The equipment fund largely 
became a thing with Sucho out of our Ukrainian colleagues saying, we would love for Sucho to keep something, but we don't have the equipment to digitize it. So that largely came out of our colleagues needing help. Um, the original intention of Sucho was not to really get into the real world, um, if you want to call it <laughs> the real world issues that involve that are involved with being in the conflict zone and um and a lot of the times what is going on exceeds our expertise and it's one of those just make it up and hope it works um situations but as we've gotten further into the process and kind of gotten our bearings and our footing um we also realize that we can go forward and help prepare other people for the future um, and their digital collections. And that is um, anywhere from advocating for institutions or anyone that has a significant digital collection, or if you have a digital collection of your family photographs to prepare for something. And that can be anything from a tornado to an earthquake or God forbid, another conflict somewhere. And it's it also stresses the importance of digital heritage. The digital world is still very new in terms of human history. And so sometimes the concept of heritage existing online is a very niche and sometimes a little too esoteric for a lot of people to comprehend. Um, as you can see down here, there's an image of the Blue Shield. The Blue Shield was made for con protection of cultural heritage and conflict. Uh, you see these in buildings, you see them all over buildings in Europe or somewhere that would have had an active conflict zone. Uh, we kind of changed it up and put some code in there for digital heritage. Um, but it's just, we see ourselves now as being able to advocate and educate people on the importance of digital heritage because digital heritage is not going to go away. And if anything, it's going to be more native to the web. And that's what part of our inspiration for the meme and meme wall is that that is something that is created online, it is disseminated online, and it trans it transpires, it changes <laughs> online, sorry, it evolves. And so that's an extension of what we believe is this heritage, even if it's just your website or a single homepage, it's worth preserving because that is an extension of what you may have in person. So, <clears throat> this is you, Kylie. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> You'd think I'd remember where the button is after all this time. Um, so, I think that's a really good way to kind of underscore also why the memes are so important. Um, and I'm very glad that there was some interest in seeing some of these because they kind of help underscore how ephemeral digital content can be. Um, and there's a difference between digitized content, which is something that is um, physical or analog that has then been imaged or scanned in some way to make it digital and born digital content, which is something that is created as digital content and stays as digital content. So memes are, are born digital content um, and they're very, very fleeting. They're very fragile, um, but they're also very important. And so um, this piece of things is, is super interesting to me personally, um, because I just, I find memes fascinating, honestly. Um, they operate based on transmission and transformation. So you might have an image that is shared 24,000 times. That doesn't necessarily make it a meme. It might be viral, but it's not necessarily a meme unless it's actually changing. So you need both of these pieces of, of transmission and transformation to truly be a meme. And they can be identified uh, based on shared characteristics, such as shared templates or repeated text. Um, and right now they're being used in a really fascinating way. And there's actually a lot of academic work being done in this moment on this um, because they're being used to combat disinformation um, and also pro-Russian opinion. 
So there are groups um, such as, I don't know if there are any Twitter users on here, but um, you may have seen the NAFO fellas. Um, they use a kind of derivative of the Doge meme to troll um, accounts that are sharing Russian disinformation um, or just pro-Russian opinion. And they basically, not to use a dog joke, but they dogpile them um, and just spam them with memes until they stop. And it's a very interesting way of shutting down disinformation, not by combating it with information, but by just annoying them until they stop. Um, and it's, it's pretty effective. Um, and then there are also memes, of course, that are methods of sharing information. And we'll see some of those. Um, this one on the bottom here on the left is uh, the very common groom meme template um, taken from Despicable Me. And on the right, you can see an example of, of, this, of this template being used. So you have both the transformation and then it's been shared many, many times. So it's the transmission as well, which makes it a meme. So the example is we invade Ukraine, head straight to Kiev, they steal our tanks. They steal our tanks? I enjoyed this one a lot personally. Um, and one of the things that's important to note about these is that there are some that are extremely graphic, extremely vulgar, um, very, very difficult to view. And I did not pick those uh, for this presentation um, because they really require consent to view because they're, they're some of them are very, very difficult. Many of these are intended to be funny. Um, it's one of the ways that they get attention. It's one of the ways that they share uh, or they are shared um, is because they're entertaining, but their primary purpose is not to entertain. Their primary purpose is to either combat disinformation, like I said, spread information. Any of these kind of uses is more of a primary use than humor, but humor is important in their transmission. So many of these are funny. It is okay to laugh at them, um, but there are some that are, are quite difficult to view. Um, for the most part, we don't have many of those on the meme wall, um, but we do have some on the meme wall that are, are fairly vulgar or, or somewhat difficult to view. So just kind of keep that in mind um, if, you, if you go to view it. Um, this one is an example of the kind of galaxy brain template. Um, Ukraine belongs to Russia because of USSR. Both are independent states. And then the galaxy brain version is Russia belongs to Ukraine because of Kievan Rus. <laughs> Um, this one is a, a kind of a spoof on Grand Theft Auto, uh, Grand Theft Auto Ukraine edition, um, with a tractor pulling a tank, uh, which was one of the ways that abandoned Russian tanks were towed. <laughs> um, this one is a very, very common meme template uh, many people have likely seen before with the little girl watching the burning building. Um, this was actually a controlled burn in, I believe, the 1990s. Um, and this little girl and her family went to watch it and she just happened to make this face. But in this, in this context, um, the burning house is the Crimean bridge and the little girl smiling is all of Ukraine. I've also, it's important to note not to keep interrupting myself, but that um, I overrepresented some of our English language memes here um, because some of the uh, Ukrainian or Russian language memes took a little bit more time to explain. And some of them were a little bit outside of my kind of knowledge base to be able to explain them to you. Um, so they're definitely not all in English. <laughs> um, this one, Great Russian Culture um, is, a little bit less of a, a meme template, but it still makes a visual statement. So it's kind of on the border of being a true meme and maybe not, um, but it's close enough that we included it anyway. This one, again, another very common uh, meme template. Why would NATO make me do this? Um, this one is a, an infographic, which we're seeing a lot as a template. Um, Ikea returns to Russia and it's an image of the steps to construct a coffin. This one is an image from uh, Mad Max Fury Road with one of the large vehicles in the middle replaced with a photoshopped HIMAR. <laughs> um, this one is an example of some of the ones that are a little bit more difficult. Um, this one is a, a kind of a spoof on the Franklin books. Um, Franklin goes to Ukraine um, and it's acting as a satire for the fact that very young soldiers are being sent to fight in Ukraine. This one um, is on top, an image of a butterfly in three stages of life, and on the bottom, um, an image of a Russian soldier beneath the caterpillar, an image of a trash bag beneath the chrysalis, and an image of a lotta beneath the butterfly. 
And the reason for this was that um, when Russian soldiers were killed in Ukraine or are killed in Ukraine, they're often put in trash bags because there's nothing else to put their remains in. Um, and the Lada is a reference to the fact that the Russian government had told um, the families of deceased Russian soldiers that they would receive a Lada as thanks for their son's participation in the war. Um, this one, again, one of the more difficult ones, um, a Russian soldier looking in the mirror and seeing a trash bag instead of his face. Um, this one is a spoof on Plants vs. Zombies, a, a fairly popular video game, um, maybe not so much anymore, but several years ago at least it was quite popular. Um, and the zombie is wearing a helmet with a Z on it and is standing around the sunflowers, which are a major part of the game and of course symbolic of Ukraine. There are many, many, many memes about Vladimir Putin um, and none of them are charitable. <laughs> That's all they should not be. Um, this one, he's reading a, a book that is How to Win the War Against Ukraine, A Guide for Idiots. This one on the right, tell me how, in one word how the war is going. Good. Tell me in two words, not good. Um, this is another very common format. So you can see kind of how um, images and concepts are shared between them. Um, this is the Bavovna. So uh, you can see an image here on the top right um, of the explosion on the Crimean beach, except uh, it's been replaced by a, um, uh, the head of a cotton plant. On the bottom is a, a HIMAR, um, except instead of, of explosives, it's also throwing cotton. On the top, um, Crimea's Bavovna is a Pantone color. And then on the right um, is the kind of very famous cowboy hat screaming cat, um, which has appeared in many, many memes this time in place of the kind of cloud from the explosion. Um, and the reason for this is the relationship between the words in Ukrainian and Russian, where it means explosion, but it also means cotton. Um, so it's a spoof kind of on the, on the difference of the words between the two languages. And then these hot off the press, not on the meme wall yet, um, are from the um, theft of the raccoon from her song this weekend. Um, so this one, I mean, these these memes come out as soon as news breaks. It is it is immediate. It is faster <laughs> than you'd expect. Um, so this one, you thought you're taking me prisoner. No, I'm taking you prisoner. This one um, is a spoof on the Saving Private Ryan movie poster um, with uh, obviously, um, Ukrainian political figures and the raccoon instead of um, the actors from Saving Private Ryan. And then this one, um, our kind of last one, is the watermelons from Kirsan, which was, again, immediate that these were coming out. Um, so a watermelon and a helmet. And then this one was my personal favorite from this set that I, I chose to show today, um, which is a watermelon chasing a soldier. A watermelon with big teeth chasing a soldier. There we go. Thank you all so much for joining us. I think now is uh, we're going to take questions. Yes, absolutely. So some questions have already been coming in. Uh, I actually have some things, but first of all, I wanted to clarify. Um, I think some people were confused, uh, the non-tech folks in the audience, by the term scraping. Uh, so basically, the the term, if I can, if I can. Um, uh, jump on you guys. Uh, I mean, you're welcome to answer, but it's I, I sort of um, answered in the in the chat of it's basically it's basically like making a copy of a website. Uh, loosely speaking, it's taking a public website. So if you had a website and I can go and get the data from your website because it's public and make a copy of it and keep it. I don't know if you can you can elaborate if you want to. Yeah, so scraping is, I mean, it that's very, in a very basic sense, that's what it is, and I'm not a programmer, um, but scraping is getting pretty much all the code, anything that is required to build or what you see, whatever is required to recreate that in a different instance or a different location, that's what scraping does. It basically scrapes the bottom of the barrel um, that has built the website. And so that's, I don't know where they got the nerve to tame, oh my gosh, the term scraping, but yeah. yeah. I nice. definitely had to Google that like the first week of Sujo. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I think that's both a really good explanation. I also don't know where scraping comes from in terms of 
a term. Um, but I always kind of think of it as like, if you have a kiwi, you want to scoop the fruit out of the, um, the skin. So web scraping kind of scrapes the contents of the website out in a form that can then be reused, but separates it from the kind of structure that normally holds it. Um, and it creates a, a copy of it that can be digitally preserved or, or shared or, or replaced um, into the website with finagling. Of course, it's not quite that easy, um, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, Kylie put some of the links to the the uh, galleries and things into the chat, so it makes it easier for you to get those. Uh, thank you for that. Um, please go ahead and, and put other questions in the chat if you are so interested, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question um, on uh, directly, that's fine too. There's a small enough this is a small enough group that we can get away with that. I think I think I hope. Um, one of the questions that I had, I mean, you spend a lot of time on the memes, which is which is interesting. And that's, I think, from a historical point of view, this is playing a, a very major role. And so documenting that is is going to be important for, for future historians in 50 years from now or 100 years from now, whenever they, they look at this and try to understand how this war progressed, even though it might seem frivolous, it, it is it's pretty important um but going away from the memes can you tell maybe a little bit about some of the some of the things that we would more typically consider to be cultural heritage um that you might think are particularly interesting that people could look for in the in the gallery um at least for me i I did a lot of recording of we had a we have a tool called a web recorder and it for those who are not technically inclined it's basically you record yourself going through a website and you're the one controlling everything um, and we had to do that a lot for instances like the Odessa Fine Arts Museum um, the Jewish Museum in Odessa I did a lot of Odessa. I don't know why. I think I just, I guess I want to go to Odessa one day. Um, but I did a lot of the 3D tours um, and virtual tours. And that required someone, if you couldn't create a custom scrape, basically be a genius programmer, um, you needed to use that tool. And I would sit there late into the night, especially if we had alerts going up, just going through. And I thought it was great um, because it was a nice way to quickly disassociate from everything else going on. Um, and it's also something I did during the pandemic to kind of chill out was to do virtual tours. So um, those really do allow you to kind of get a sense and go through these exhibits. One of my favorite ones is the Donetsk Regional Museum. Um, they had a, an exhibit in 3D format for the history of resistance in Donetsk. So it felt very timely to be doing, going through this exhibit um, in, in the middle of March. So, yeah. Yeah, this is um, the, what I just pulled up to screen share is actually the gallery itself. This is the, the public view. Um, I'm not sure if, well, I mean, this is also my admin view, but I think you should only be seeing the, the public um, images. So one of the things that that has been a little bit challenging throughout the process is the fact that there's there's kind of two um, kinds of cultural heritage. So there's tangible cultural heritage, which is things like physical objects, like what you see here on the screen, where there is um, uh, flint products, where there is uh, a Greek amphora from the colonies in the northern Black Sea coast, um, the Hun diadem. Um, uh, Kipchak uh, art. And so things that are very tangible, which is a little bit more of what we would think of when we think of cultural heritage, um, which are kind of those things that you can go and see maybe in a museum, um, things that are so-called tangible because they're they are tangible. There's something you could go and probably not touch, um, but theoretically touch. But there's also a lot of intangible cultural heritage. And that's been one of the things that's been very difficult for us throughout this process is how do we represent that? So we have, um, let's see if I can find a, a good example here um, of some intangible cultural heritage. Things like performances, um, 
uh, uh, songs, so music, maybe that isn't actually written music, but performed music, so sound, um, video of performances. I know we have some performances in here. Um, and things that are, are more difficult for us to preserve. Um, of course, it's going to be on like the last pages I click as I'm taking everyone on a World War tour here. Um, but it's very difficult to, here's a, here's a good example. So this is an image from a play um, in, I believe, 2016? Yeah, 2016. Um, so it's very difficult to represent things like that because you can only get a very small snapshot of it. And it's not as easy as including a picture of an amphora, which is already kind of challenging because if there's art on multiple sides, then you have to do a little bit more work to represent that whole thing. And so one of the focuses of, of the kind of the way that we're approaching this, knowing that we have these, these difficulties is um, we're, we have a way that we can uh, embed YouTube videos. So when there are um, performances and things that we have found, we can embed a YouTube video into uh, the gallery. But with something like this, where it's just an image, um, we did not find a recording of this. There was no recording of this on the site that was scraped that this was taken from. Um, so one of our major focuses, again, the fact that this is not our material, um, is that there is always the link in here so that people can view the original source. And I'm not going to open this because we, I, we scan every website before we open it to make sure that there's no malware. Um, and I'm not going to click on this without doing that. But when someone views these, these images, um, videos, et cetera, they can go back to that original source, view the institution's website if it's available um, and be able to see more information, more images, et cetera. So get a more complete view um, of, of these materials. And that's one of our things kind of in our about um, and kind of like how to navigate is the suggestion of, of doing that, of using this as a stepping point to explore these institutions and what they have. Yeah, I think there's all kinds of discoverability and, and access ways of, of having people navigate through all this stuff. But again, it's it's not it's not your stuff. It's not our stuff. So that's 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 a whole whole separate issue. Uh, Stephen has a question in the com in the comments. Um, uh, is there val valuable information on Facebook that needs to be preserved? Do you have any kind of arrangement or agreement with Facebook? Many people towns, churches, et cetera, in Ukraine have Facebook pages where there is a great amount of information posted. So how, how, are you, how, if at all, are you dealing with social media, I guess? So it's That's an interesting part, and I think we really haven't figured out a way to do that. Um, there are a lot of institutions that are on Facebook, and that's actually their primary source of um, web, public-facing web access. And ultimately, the because of the live, I always have to go back and describe it. We're we're trying to respond to an act of war, and ultimately, the material that's on Facebook is not in Ukraine. It's housed in Facebook servers around the world, um, and they are ultimately a very high um, high end, high security. Um, instance that will we don't need to worry about that right now um, other issues that come up I mean lines of continuity in terms of access to get onto their websites could be an issue um, but Sutra was really started and kind of is continued as worried about the websites and some of those aren't necessarily hosted in Ukraine um, but we still archive them because we were concerned that people who may have fled won't be able to get back to it or access it for a while again to just kind of we call it a summer camp for websites um our little campers and when their parents come pick them up we'll give them back um and so the facebook as much as we want to and we would have loved to do that it was really impractical on our end we didn't have the infrastructure to really support that and ultimately what facebook has we couldn't rival and so it was. It's pretty well insulated, um, and they keep them up for I don't even know how long. Probably forever. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. This uh, this may be a kind of a more technical answer than you're looking for to that as well. But um, the data structure of Facebook is very, very, very difficult to deal with. They use a very um, proprietary. 
proprietary. It's it's uh, okay. I don't have a nicer word than messy. Um, okay, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So the 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 JSON that that organizes their data is it requires a lot a lot of cleaning before it can be used. So we need metadata to be able to to preserve any of this. We need to be able to find it afterwards. So not only knowing what file is from where, what file came from what website, et cetera. So all of that has to be in the metadata. And so we would need that to come out of the JSON and it would be an enormous task for us to clean that data into a form that we could use it as identifying information. Um, so it's a it's a huge, huge lift to do something like that. Um, there have been plenty of projects that have done that, um, but it's enormous. It's it's much right. more difficult than it sounds. Yeah. No. And just for the again, the 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 the, the non-computer geeks, uh, which um uh, I, I do consider myself a computer geek. So uh, the, the the term JSON got tossed around there. You can just think of that. That's it's it's like a file with with data in it. And mm -hmm. with that structured in a certain way, that's that's all you need to know about it. Um, and that's that's the form that that a lot of this gets spit spat out in. Um, what was I going? To, I was going to. Oh yes. So there there are. I I suspect. I don't know of them, but I'm. I suspect that there are project probably projects out there uh, outside of Sucho that is that are trying to tackle this. I know there is the um, this absolutely astounding guy down in i think university of texas austin um named steve steven siegel mm -hmm. yeah. who is not no connection to the to the putin friendly actor even though they have extremely similar sounding names uh he has been doing what he calls his february 24th twitter archive mm -hmm. so he has like been attempting and i'm not sure how he's doing things on the back end whether it's being um uh, what the digital preservation aspects of the, that is, but he has been doing insane stuff of trying to track like responses to the war on a real time basis on Twitter. It's yeah. astounding. I don't know how the man does it. Yeah, there, I don't there know also folks. Oh, sorry. Um, Steve is a great supporter of Sucho. I mean, he's really been a supporter since day one. I actually had the very fortunate privilege of um i live in texas so i was able to meet up with him very early on in the war um i i don't know if he sleeps i really don't um what he's doing is incredible and um having his support has been really beneficial to sucho because sometimes we at least in situation monitoring we were able to talk out twitter a little bit because twitter is a very valuable resource for open source information um yeah he I I'm always in awe of what he does because I, I don't know how he does that because he teaches full time as well. So he's an incredible person. Yeah, there are folks to um, I can't remember if they if they had a specific name for their kind of working group or not, but uh, that are also archiving telegram um, telegram channels as well and the content that's that's in there. I don't know very much about um, who is doing that or, or what the kind of work that they're doing is but i know that i know that it exists <laughs> i think the key thing we have to remember even i mean this is just for anybody that i mean i stress in a normal daily life that when it comes to social media we also have terms of services so mm -hmm. in each company has different terms in which what we can and cannot do and there are ways to access this information and preserve it but oftentimes those are blocked if that company decides we don't want that out there or we don't want the people to have ability to do that so on top of everything else that makes trying to do all these archiving of social media channels hard it's on top of do we want to get kicked off do we want to get a lawsuit or these really kind of intense questions that amount to violating terms of service yeah yeah there no it's these copyright issues in terms of service mm -hmm. issues are very always always a landmine yeah. um just so we can move along here oh incidentally if if you're on twitter and you want to keep track of the war i always tell people just just follow steve and you'll get everything um one last question um there uh how can people support sutro you 
can donate at Open Collective. Yeah. Mike, I know that you shared one in the chat. Um, that the main link will have the normal everyday donation site. Um, Open Collective is a European website um, because we have some of our organizers in Europe. Um, it's pretty much akin to a 501c3 in the United States. Um, and you can also contribute directly to our equipment fund on that um, on that website. Um, the general fund will go from, for anything for us buying licenses, for software, for us to use. Um, I can't tell you how many accounts, Kylie, I'm sure you have so many now too for Sucho. Um, and we've also been able to hire a remote um, Ukrainian national um, logistician to help us with the equipment fund. So we've been able to do really great things with it. Um, and share share our website, share the gallery. Um, word of mouth has done a lot for Sutro. So, are you still looking for volunteers? We're always um, looking for volunteers. Oh yeah, we have so yeah. many projects going on. Honestly, uh, we and we love anytime we find someone that can speak Russian, Polish, Ukrainian. Um, a lot of us have been trying to learn Ukrainian since. Sucho started. Um, I'm not great at it. I can read it. Don't ask me to speak it. Um, <laughs> so we can use, we can always use native speakers. Um, and really any, that's the beauty of Ukraine. It has a very rich history. And so we have information and we have heritage from, um, sorry, Romania, Moldova, all these different countries um, that at one point lived in Ukraine and as we know it today, so. Yeah, and there's English. there's always plenty of work. Also, if you only speak English, there is loads and loads and loads of work um, that either we have workflows in place that will kind of help you parse some of the Ukrainian language or that is specifically just in English. So, because like Erica said, we have a lot of, of native English speakers um, or folks from Europe who, who speak their native language, but don't speak Ukrainian. So we have a lot of different um, fluency levels. So don't let that be something that stops you. And you get to learn to read it really quick. Yep, that's true. <laughs> it's great talent to have in your back pocket. Yep. <laughs> uh, somebody asked about Ukrainian historical periodical archives. I, I suspect you're probably hitting those um, like libraria.ua and yeah. Yeah, I think that um, was a massive site to crawl, actually. You can imagine. Yeah, that uh, was and like, problematic. And, and like and like Diasporiana, which is in um, mm. which is in um, in Berdyansk. So they're they've been under occupation right from the beginning. I'm kind of mm. amazed that that site is still functional. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, actually that's an interesting point that we didn't actually touch on. Is that they're one of the threats that um, the sites face too? Is that they do stay up. Um, but sometimes they get replaced with Russian information. Um, so government websites and stuff that we have, have scraped as well now have different content if they're in occupied areas. Um, We've also had so I'm glad you said that because we didn't even talk about that. We've had, I, and I didn't know about this until I encountered it. We, there have been sites of Ukrainian cultural heritage that have been hijacked, essentially. Um, I haven't seen it since Bucha. Um, but I can tell you without going into very descriptive terminology, um, it basically was to demonstrate or to showcase the war crimes that happened. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. That's why we are very security minded as um, Kylie mentioned, she didn't want to open a link without scanning it first um, because we have run into these instances where it's either very graphic, very kind of traumatizing. I don't want to say it because that's a very um, broad term to use. But it's it's it runs the gamut, and you learn a lot very quick mm -hmm. about the world of the internet. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. I think we've hit all the questions, and we're at eight oh seven. So uh, we've definitely definitely used all of our time. Thank you again so much, Kylie and Erica. It was fantastic. Um, presentation on sort of a corner that we at the UHCC don't usually deal with, at least not publicly. Um, of course, those of us in the library and archives we world deal with these sorts of issues all the time, but usually that's hidden from our 
from our public facing um, activities. So thank you for highlighting that, uh, getting comments saying about how, how great your talk was, that's and echoing my, my comments as well. So again, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody joining us and stay safe, stay warm, cold spell going on and um, Slava Ukraini. Good night.